people were like, what? There's no way that's happening. Like, we're not going to control robots with our minds. What happened that made this suddenly, and not so sudden, but in, in 10 years, essentially, in the right. last five years, explode into the mainstream the way it has? I sort of have three things that I talk about, and I think this is, you know, across the space that we're talking about now. Um, the first thing is that uh, neurotechnology itself has finally caught up with Moore's law, not the other way around, right? So we're finally starting to use microelectronic circuits, miniature, uh, you know, components. We're actually able to put the compute on the person, in the brain, uh, in ways that we've never been able to do before. So yes, you know, humans can, with brain implants, control robotic arms and, and context. The second thing is that I like to call it from synapses to systems. So uh, neuroscience itself came out of a very molecular biology world, you know, how, how cells communicate with one another. But now because of imaging, because of cognitive neuroscience, we really understand the networks in the brain and we're starting to understand disease states as perturbations in those networks. That gives us the opportunity to change those networks in the brain using neurostimulation, using psychedelic medicine, using things like that. And the last point itself is neuroplasticity. When I was in graduate school, we were taught that the brain of adults didn't really change that much through adulthood. Now we know that the, the brain remains plastic throughout adulthood and we can use these tools and techniques that we're gonna talk about in order to change our states. And I think those three things for me are what's really causing the revolution in, in the solutions that we're seeing now. So given that, let's talk about what are the two of you really, and everyone in the audience should listen up on this because this is important because they're both business people and investing in this. What is most exciting to you out of all the things we're about to talk about? So um, I'm going to follow it on with saying there are two things that I'm most excited about right now. One is around precision psychiatry or precision neuroscience. So I just talked about those networks in the brain, right? I talked about how we're starting to uh, affiliate and associate those networks and those, those states with actual, you know, disease conditions, whether that's depression obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, anxiety. Um, the idea right now is that we can actually understand how those networks in the brain will predict how someone will respond to a particular treatment even, right? So now pharmaceutical companies are starting to engage using these biomarkers to understand if their drugs or devices are working. Eventually, we will get to the point where we can actually use that as a screening tool, a diagnostic, to get people into the right treatment the first time. Right now, we're essentially experimenting. Some of the work in oncology, though, I understand so that with chemotherapy and certain right. types of chemotherapy that have not been good for somebody, they will now know we right. should never if you have, have a particular type of tumor, right now they can essentially sequence that tumor and say, this will work, that won't work, just do that first. We're getting to that level with mental health and with, with the brain. The second thing I'm excited about is what I talked about briefly neuro, uh, neurostimulation, non-invasive neurostimulation, using low intensity focused ultrasound, using uh, other energy, electricity, magnets, to actually perturb those brain states. That's exciting because now, uh, with like, things like low intensity focused ultrasound, you can actually get into the depth of the brain and control nodes in those networks that are deep within our brains. And that's a whole new, uh, whole new capability that we've never had before. Well, and on that point, Matthias, you used a word that I'd never heard of before when we were talking, which was interceutical. Is that something that you're excited about? And tell us what that might be about. Yeah. So usually at SciMed, we think in terms of, you know, paradigm changes and so much of what you see as innovation in healthcare it's like very kind of incremental innovation that, don't get me wrong, it's much needed uh, to improve processes, to get things like, you know, to work 5% better. I think that where venture capital is best suited is to make uh, investments and partner with entrepreneurs that are really rethinking how the world works, right? And so, so this idea of nutraceuticals is a different paradigm than the existing one, which is mostly about pharmaceuticals right, drugs. And so nutraceuticals is basically using different um, uh, energy stimuli that could be electrical stimuli or uh, light or sound or magnetic stimulation to, as Amy was saying, 
modulate different kind of brain systems and brain networks. To put it differently, how different parts of the brain communicate with each other, right? And this is to improve it, dramatically alter it? Will it does it make any kind of, you know, permanent long-term solutions? That's an that's interesting question about the long-term solutions because uh, an interesting thing about uh, neuromodulation, this idea of using energy to stimulate uh, the brain, is that the way I explain it to my sister or my mom or my dad is that it's somewhere in between a drug and therapy. What do I mean by this? It's actually retraining your brain to behave and act in specific ways, right? And so in that sense, it's more long-term acting than, let's call it an SSRI or, you know, pretty much any other psychiatric drug. Like right. an a- antidepressant, which is an SSRI. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to say, that's that's building into that topic that we talked about, which is neuroplasticity, right? As you put energy into these systems, the the networks themselves reshape, right? And and that's why I think we see durability, what we call durability of these, of these treatments, right? Because they're actually changing the long-term, you know, firing and structure of the brain, which is amazing. And I also think what's great is that in the context of the work that we think about, we think about both clinical applications, but we also think about beneficial applications, human performance applications. You know, I think there's a there's a broad space there. Yeah, I, I, there's a, I wanted to give an example that really plays into that. A company we invested in uses transcranial focused ultrasound, what uh, Amy was mentioning before, to stimulate or downregulate actually a part of very uh, deep part of the brain called the amygdala and this part is you know associated with fear or fight or flight mode which is what folks with uh, experiencing post traumatic stress disorder struggle with right what's interesting about transcranial focus ultrasound is that if you zap or stimulate that part of the brain um, experienced meditators will say that they are in a similar state that they enter when they've been um, meditating for 10 hours, right? That's kind of interesting where how, you know, technology that can be used for uh, PTSD can also be used to get into this state that's a deep meditative state that it may take you 10 years to get to. Can you actually paint a picture of how does this ultrasound work? How frequently do you have to do it? Where do you go? How, like, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Yeah, so it's it's still in development now, but it essentially, ultrasound is sound waves, right? So they're using similar types of frequencies that people have been using for, you know, decades now to do actual imaging. But the part that's focused, right, is essentially, uh, you know, a way of lensing. So imagine it as a lens and you're actually able to focus those sound that sound energy, those sound beams into the depth of the brain. And then you, you, you modulate it in the same way that you would modulate sound. So is it 10 hertz? Is it 15 hertz? Um, in general, it follows the same type of um, protocols that people have used in like transcranial magnetic stimulation. So once a day, you know, somewhere between five to 10 minutes a day, and then the person comes in and experiences that over the course of a week. Um, so it's pretty exciting because it's, it's something that can actually get into the depth of the brain, whereas magnetics and electricity have not, they mostly stay in the cortex. And do, do you have a sense of, is it something you do once for a yeah. couple of days and then you don't go back again yeah, for yeah, years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it- so right now people are experimenting with protocols that will uh, take essentially the, a week long um, and see durable effects probably up to six months, maybe a year where, you know, as people are working on the clinical implications of this, we're figuring that stuff out. Um, that's what we were talking about durability. Some people will probably be better responders than others, but it's intended to be a treatment that would easily last for months, if not longer. And then, uh, the other answer to the question is that we don't know because it's so early. And <laughs> I gave so, a very sciencey <laughs> answer. Sorry, Matthias. No, you're absolutely a right. Specific. Um, and, but, but what's my point here is that there could be a future where actually there's a very, very small focus ultrasound device where you don't need to go to the clinic and you can do it at home totally. for 10 minutes a day. And so maybe you just get a maintenance dose once every few months and that's it. Again, that that's not the future that exists today, yeah. but there are a lot of very... Uh, solid reasons in terms of how technology is progressing and what I mean in more particular is miniaturization and how you can make these components way smaller so you can actually get it at home. Moore's Law, again, Moore's Law. 
Right. Moore's law being the uh, exponential reduction of the amount of power on a chip. A lot of people might be thinking, well, we remember, for those of us a certain age, the electroshock therapy and what came out of that and the negative associated with that. But we're talking about very small, low, low. Can you give us kind of a sense of of that? It's very particular to brain regions, right? So uh, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, which, by the way, is still effective. It's effective. It just has side effects, right? Uh, Memory disruptions and other things like that. Think of that as like the big knob, right? You, you, you couldn't control that energy going through the brain so that the entire brain got all that energy, right? Now, when we're talking about focused ultrasound, you're saying, I only want to augment this part of the brain. Like he was talking about like, the amygdala or somewhere in the prefrontal cortex. You can be that specific. 